Today's guests are Megan and Mark McCann of MGM Solar Solutions. We're going to talk about solar panels, but it isn't just about solar panels. It's about a culture change. New Brunswick has a reputation of being stuck in the 60s and really resistant to change. The time has come when technology has reached such a point that things can change for us drastically in a short period of time. We just need to be able to see it, have the vision, and then the will to do it. Megan and Mark take us on a journey, it's a little technical at times, but the potential and the reality that it's just there on the threshold, right there on the doorstep, if we can just let go of how we've always done things and embrace what we need to do in 2020 so that 2040 and 2060 make New Brunswick one of the best places to live. Let's start right away with solar power households or slightly bigger than households and a province that really struggles with change. And I'm generalizing, <laughs> but you're trying to break in uh, an industry, but also a culture. It's not just about, you know, volts and ohms and retrofitting your house and smart meters or um, putting back into the grid. It's about a mindset about how do we build today for 30, 40 years from now. So can you wander into the, the culture that you're now working in and what it's like trying to change that culture? You want to start? Well, it's New Brunswick is very set in their ways and so trying to change that it, it's been very difficult and we have a couple of very dominant industries here uh, MB Power is one of them Irving is another but that's a whole nother mm -hmm. story but as a little company we're always competing against these big companies and so with solar we're trying to bring it back to the people uh, we're trying to decentralize who has the power, who's making the power. And with solar, that is, it's really bringing the power back to the people. And No pun intended. No, no <laughs> pun intended. But that, that is the challenge, is trying to show people how they can take the power back. Hmm. Hmm. Um, yeah, it's neat. Well, part of it is just, it's just the education of the technology how does it work hmm. what do I need to do how long is it going to last is it going to last yeah. how breakable are these things uh, a lot of confusion there, there's a lot of confusion around the whole industry because it's new it's not as accepted as you know something that we used to deal with before that's now something that we've had forever so yeah it's coming so, good um, I wanted to start there because it Let's go at some of the great myths or misconceptions and, and let's knock them down. Boom, boom, boom. You know, so so it's too expensive. You know, I got I have to put this stuff on my house. I won't see a return on my investment for 30, 40 years kind of mindset. You want to speak to that one? Because, you know, that's not. Yeah, no, that's that's not true. <laughs> that's not true. <laughs> that's not true. 30, 40 years. Yeah, probably back in, uh, you know, early 2000s and 7s yeah. to maybe around 2010 yeah. but that was it was about 25 so in four years it dropped significantly and this last year it dropped again because some of the uh the tariffs that exist down in the states in order to sell from the uh the asian markets they've actually dropped the cost of their modules yeah. and that's led to other manufacturers to drop their prices too to compete with that yeah. where there are no tax credits so we've seen another reduction in price at those points where a uh, lot of stuff is being installed under two dollars a watt now. So, and compared to the utility, so MV Power here in New Brunswick, they charge eleven point one eight cents a kilowatt hour to install solar without any incentives. Right now, we're installing at under ten cents a kilowatt hour. So we've reached this grid parity. Mm -hmm. Below, yeah. Now we're we're looking more around. Uh, I think what was the latest we we're looking at seven seven to eight yes. cents a kilowatt hour okay. and on larger scale projects you can get it down even lower than that so the larger the solar system the the prices drop obviously so 
there's things that we have to incorporate into an overall price. So there's permitting and other... Permits and labor and, and fees and all associated stuff. When looked at a smaller wattage system, like a thousand watt system, we'll say that's four panels. The cost per watt on that is quite high, so it's over $5 a watt. But once you add more watts, then the cost per watt, which leads to your ROI, is reduced. Yeah. I brought a sample of a solar proposal if we were to get what we wanted. Uh, so right now we're really pushing for a solar, a direct solar incentive here in New Brunswick. Uh, Nova Scotia and PEI have direct solar incentives and they're working really well. Uh, as soon as they had uh, been put out to the public, there was a number of solar companies that you know, started almost overnight, and people are installing. So this is an example of government instituting or implementing some new policy, and it's creating a shift in the marketplace that's creating jobs and creating something for households, like yes. some sort of benefit for households. Yes. So this is where the role of government in business actually kind of makes sense because it's shifting something or inviting something. Yes. Okay. I wanted that to be caught. So that means New Brunswick still needs to tune into that potential yes absolutely like right now what MB power does uh, so they have their solar incentive but what you have to do is uh, you have a home energy audit and what they do is they they basically look at all of the inefficiencies of a home hmm. and you have to upgrade these efficiencies it could be insulation it could be windows there's a number of different things but you have to do that first before you can even apply for the solar incentive. And it's a 20 to 30 cent uh, kilowatt. Yeah, I think it's $250 to $3,000 a kilowatt for an incentive uh, if you go through the, the uh, efficiency program that they have. And uh, so that's money the household has to pay up front before they even qualify? Yes. So we, we had a home just Possibly. recently. Okay. Possibly. Okay, it may be you may have a home that was built to a higher standard that has all of the efficiencies already done. All right. Uh, and then in that case, you may not have to. Uh, we've seen new homes where the building code hasn't enforced the same rules that, or sorry, the same building code that the utility is looking for, mm -hmm. for these. Mm -hmm. So we get some uh, miscommunication in between even just the building code to what they're accepting yeah. in order to even qualify for them. So so for this one particular household, it would have been $8,000. It was a brand new home, $8,000 worth of uh, upgrades they needed to do before they could get a $1,300 solar incentive. So there's some that would argue that that's the way to go. I've heard that for the 20 years. It's like put the money into conservation and insulation as opposed to going with this new fancy technology. You wanna speak to that a little bit? Because to me, it's like apples and oranges. Um, generating your own power and having a bit of autonomy is very different from making sure my house is as energy efficient as possible. But they, those things get mixed. So can yeah. you give us some clarity? Yeah, so we always look at any time that we go into a home, what are you using for a source of heat? Where's your hot water? Uh, are there any other way that we can drop the cost of how many uh, kilowatt hours or sorry is there any way that we can drop the amount of kilowatt hours you use in a year mm -hmm. in order for us to sell you a smaller system so i, I usually say i'm a terrible salesman because i don't <laughs> want to sell you the size of system that you need today i want to sell you the size of a system that you eventually do need once you do some of these efficiencies so through that we're able to look at uh, how are they heating the water generally a lot of people just go with the rental so you get a rental from MB Power, or St. John, or Civic, or somebody. And those are the worst, most inefficient ways to heat your water. So we get rid of those with option A or option B. Uh, we can either cut all of the energy cost out from electric with uh, like a tankless hot water heater, or we can go with uh, something like a, uh, a heat pump water heater. So comparing the two, a heat pump water heater will use $123 a year. Uh, the regular 40 gallon will use 400 17 or whatever 
whatever they say on that little uh, yeah and the tag placard. on the yeah, on the thing that seems to be a lie anyway yeah <laughs> <laughs> so if we slid back to nova scotia and that they've implemented policy and i interrupted you to capture a point so keep going oh so uh now this this is a a proposal with a a pretend ten thousand dollar rebate like they do in nova scotia and with that it we're looking at under nine years for an ROI for solar. So on, on how much? Uh, Ten thousand dollar yep. system, so twenty thousand dollar system. We we took the average system. Uh, the average home in New Brunswick uses, I think, it's thirty four kilowatt hours a day. So you take that average, you multiply it by um, by your three hundred and sixty five days, and it gives you a system size around twelve thousand kilowatt hours. So if you take that, you do some solar math, it equals about a 10 kilowatt system. So that seems to be the pretty average system that you would put in, uh, you know, according to all of the, the stats that we have. So we, we took that and typically... So this, this particular system, though, was a 15 and a half kilowatt size. Okay, good. Oh, and this was modeled after actually someone's home, so... Yeah, yeah good. This, <laughs> this was an actual uh, quote that we did and just added the ten thousand dollar incentive so it um it it was going to produce 104 percent of their home energy so it would be a net zero home and they were going to let me see the roi was going to be in nine years so they were saving 178 dollars a month putting in solar and and that's with a ten thousand dollar incentive, they'd be saving seventy seven thousand dollars over the thirty years. So when you guys say stuff like that, and we're riffing a fair number of numbers, but it, that's the way it is at the front end of the learning curve of this. Um, do people believe you? We can usually <laughs> just show them. Uh, one of the tools that I use is um, I have a mobile app on my on my phone, and when I go to a customer's house, I can show them when we're talking about a heat pump. You know, like a, a certain size. How much energy does that use and how do you know? Well, I just pull up my phone. I take out the heat pump app. I open it, turn it on, and then they can see it. I said, this is what it's going to use. And um, you can also see my production curve because my solar is being monitored. My utility use is being monitored. And I have control over some of the home. It's, it really shows you exactly what you're using and what you're producing on the home. So we like to use a microinverter system. There's a couple of different types of technology with solar, but we prefer microinverters. So we can see what each panel is producing on the home. We can see if there's anything wrong with a panel, but then we have the, the whole system, uh, what it's producing in real time on your phone so there's an app and you can see what your house is using and producing so this is part of where the audience needs to catch up with how much technology is integrated into what they think of as solar panels on their house because they'll picture some people might still be picturing the tubes you know inside the box and so it sounds like because of apps and software and advances in other technology like the hardware something has shifted for a household market or a small business market that you guys are at the front end of. Yes, absolutely. Hmm. Yeah, there's not much. That you, we can look at a panel every day in 15-minute decrements and tell you its temperature yeah. or the voltage added, or we can actually watch a panel wake up, we'll say, you know, and where the shading is with certain trees. So when we go and look at a house, we look at, you know, uh, any sort of shading issues, and I can show them what it'll look like on my system. Uh, I can show them what, what it's going to look like, maybe from a system that we have where we do have shading at a certain time of year, you know, in between like 7 and 8 o'clock. So I can show them, I say, this is the trees coming across, and then you'll see the shadow go across each panel. It'll go up and down, and then eventually it just goes away. Yeah. Yeah, after. It... When you're describing this, I'm trying to be the layperson, so you guys be the tech experts and think, okay, what can the audience catch from that? And all I can think of is old Star Trek, where Bones takes his tricorder and goes up and down the body and knows what's going on inside the body. It's like you get out your cell phone, you pull out the app on it and go, and this is what your system's doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah it, it's true. And even with the, uh, with, with the 
inverters that we use, if we do have an issue, like sometimes you would like to think that your internet is constant all the time, mm. you know, but it's not. I mean, we'll have issues where uh, they'll stop communicating with the internet because of, I don't know, internet restrictions or whatever it might be yeah. the reason for it going down. But if we see an issue where it's not communicating longer than a day and it's in like one, one panel is not communicating, then we can actually call our tech support when we're on site and get them to send a new signal and reset it remotely. And sometimes we can go up to a job site, look at the panel, no, it looks good. All of this is good without even getting on the roof. Uh, we can have the technicians send a reset command signal to it hmm. and fix the issue sometimes without even going on site. That sounds like when your computer doesn't want to boot up and you call the technician person, hey, take the battery out of your laptop and yeah. give it five minutes, you know, and then yeah. stick the battery back in and, oh, it's working now. Or yeah. turn the router off and wait a couple minutes. Yeah. Yeah, interesting. But, but to take it and make it common language or simple language, then it'll help demystify um, some of this. Another myth that I thought surfaces quickly, because you talked about the shadow coming across the panels. Um, some engineers will argue forever that you need constant supply. And, and so windmills and solar panels, you know, don't trust them because you're going to have peak periods and drops. It's nighttime, all that stuff. There's shadows across. Um, but technology's changed. So do you want to bang at that myth a little bit? So, I mean, if we're going to go with, uh, there's two types of systems. There, there's a system that is directly tied to the grid and it has no batteries. So that's just a straightforward grid tied, cheapest, most lowest cost that you can put in because there's no batteries. Hmm. So the other one would be a, uh, an off-grid system or a standalone system. So this system will have solar panels, it'll have batteries. So throughout the day, it will charge the batteries and then we, if we've done our job right, they'll have uh, enough energy left in the batteries to support all of the house load, whether it be the air conditioner, the fridges, the microwaves, the toasters, the, all the other stuff that people kind of don't think that you can have, but you really can. Yeah. yeah. But with, uh, with a grid tied, there's no batteries involved. You are still hooked up to the grid, yeah. and you're using the grid like a battery. And so what happens um, is you bank credits with MV Power. So if you put out 10 extra kilowatts of energy, you can use those 10 kilowatts uh, at a later time. And it's a, it's a one for one ratio here in New Brunswick. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's quite a cost efficient way to have solar. And so then you can go net zero uh, very easily. So you just, you have a system hmm. that offsets how much you're using. Hmm. Yeah. So, so that's on the small side. Yeah. Yeah, that's the small stuff. You know, <laughs> that's really easy to handle. Uh, with the solar production curve and getting back into what the engineers are concerned about with more of the intermittent power supply system that only generates power for a peak period of three yeah. to four, maybe five hours. Uh, the ways around that are having uh, systems that point in different directions, whether it be east through west, they're all good. You might lose some production with a 45 degree angle facing due east, mm -hmm. similar to be due west. But anywhere's in between, if we're going south east to Southwest, we're only looking at maybe a 92%. Uh, you know, in South, of course, it's 100. Yeah. But what you can do is you can actually, during these peak times when you don't need power, we're talking on like a utility scale. So what you can do is you can start to charge up these batteries and then you can use that energy anytime because hmm. now it's instantly deployable. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, that's the storage argument, right? Yeah. And, and there's a whole other conversation that we can do it now or later about how much battery technology has changed um, so that you don't have as much a storage issue. I, I'm more want to stick about the panels because people see those things so they think that that's you know, what it is and they don't see all the other stuff that goes on inside the house like you're talking about the app and you can scan. And the, uh, so how much have the photovoltaic cells changed in that... Um, snow on them, or cold temperatures, uh, all that Canadian sort of stuff, as well as um, they're not tubes anymore. And the, that's what I'm after, the efficiency. 
the efficiency. Something's really changed in the efficiency, hasn't it? Yeah. So our, our technology in order to uh, produce the cells and then cut the cells and then wire the cells have been the biggest advantages. So a little bit in the uh, in the chemical structure has changed uh, with more uh, with more solar panels that are being built. The more it changes, there's a, there's a few different types of cells, but for the most part, uh, in our, our industry, we're dealing with a monocrystalline cell, which is like the purest form of it, and then a polycrystalline cell. So it all starts out as this round ingot. So if you look on, at a solar panel, the cells are square. So what happens to the pieces that obviously is being cut off? So that goes into making a poly. But what they do is they... They maximize the amount of space hmm. per foot, per meter, whatever unit you want to deal with. And then that changes the efficiency output of a panel. So the output is based on, you know, watts per square foot. So the more of these cells you can pack into an area, obviously the higher the efficiency is going to be. So right now I think most of them are around 19 to 23%. And it keeps getting better, correct? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that, I mean, and that's just the production panels. There are other panels that are up over 40%, yeah, or 50%. And, or, and in the reading that you gave me to play with a little bit, and I scanned some of it, some of it's way over my head, but it's always fun to play in a new playground and see yeah. what you can pick up. But that bit about efficiencies from 6% up to 20%, now up to yeah. 40 and then they cite NASA and satellites and stuff. They've got a whole other efficiency Yeah, they're, yeah, they're, they're <laughs> quite expensive for those. I don't think we'll put many of those on a house. Yeah. yeah. But, but we're hitting some key points, though. So technology's changed to the point where you really have control over your system by going through it with your phone, and you have fine-tuning, and it's kind of done for you. Um, government does have the ability to tip the scale in a certain direction in order to create something for problems, which then shifts the culture a little bit. And let's slide a touch into the culture because um, there aren't many of you around, as in companies that do this sort of thing. Um, so there's great potential if New Brunswick was trying to become, you know, 100% energy self-sufficient at the household or community level by 2080. Um, so there's great potential there for that and getting off fossil fuels and those sorts of things. Do you want to speak into that sort of longer term vision sort of thing and then what we should be doing now in order to get there? Yeah, that's that's an easy one. So it is <laughs> we go back. We go, now we're going to go back a little bit. So it is all about uh, making everything as efficient as possible hmm. because eventually the rates are going to become just to a point where with the solar and battery technology, uh, it's going to be cheaper. It's going to be cheaper. And, and some people are going to say, well, that's 20 years away. Well, it's already happening in Nova Scotia right now. Hmm. So the rate that they pay, I think it's 0.9 cents cheaper to go solar and batteries. And so there are not a lot of companies here in New Brunswick. There really aren't many solar installers. Mm. There's a few companies, but there's so much room for growth. So there's over 400,000 meters here in New Brunswick. And if we were to just take a small fraction, if we could get 20% of the meters here in New Brunswick, we could create, what was it? To do an average size yep. on each house, which with the the distribution capacity because we're we would be on the uh you know the, the smaller voltage side of the mb power or st john hydro so 20 percent that's not a huge uptake uh in order to do that uh we're looking at uh you know if we took what was it 80 it maybe would took 20 percent so it would be eighty thousand. Eighty thousand 80 000 projects if we had 20 percent of the meters and uh, if we, the average cost is $25,000, that, that would be to offset the home. We're looking at $2 billion here in New Brunswick. And 20% of that is labor cost to install. Hmm. We could create 727 direct solar installing jobs here in the province, and they would have a $55,000 a year paying job for 10 years. So we're looking at a 10 year window of just 20% of MB powers or of New Brunswick's yep. meters. 
That's, I mean, that's fun. When you think of that, you'd think some political party or somebody would want to latch on to that beast and run with it really hard as a message and as a strategy um, because it ties into your carbon offsets stuff. Is that part of the math you've done too? Like you have you a way of showing a household as the carbon tax wheedles its way through a system. If you've got one of these things, it's going to offset some yep. of that as well. Oh, I think that's in, yeah, that's that's in this, in this one. one. Yes. Because it's, it's all connected. That's one of the great themes yeah. about power. Yeah. I like food or water. It connects everyone. So we get to go down all these different avenues. So I don't know if this one has the exact uh, so this CO2 would, offset. This would be for one home. So th this is just a, a fun yeah. uh, way. But it would it would be the, the difference of taking three cars off the road a year to do a 15 kilowatt uh, system or planting over 9,000 trees hmm. for 10 years for 10 years or driving almost 30,000 uh, fewer miles yeah so and that's just one system hmm. um, I so don't... you multiply that by the number you cited with um, you know so many over the next 10 years 80,000 yeah yeah as, so <laughs> there's New Brunswick strategy broken down to the household level which creates employment that would help the province reach reach its carbon offset uh, goals as part of a national strategy and our responsibility to our grandchildren. <laughs> yes, and New Brunswick is, they are very far behind. Well, this is where we started, like New Brunswick's kind of stuck, especially in this area. Yes. And, and I mean stuck in the best way, you know, it's not pejorative, it's just we're stuck and there's a chance to do something differently, so how do we get there? Exactly. Now, we... We kind of broke down MB Power's um, energy mixture. So they they have a renewable portfolio. By 2020, by this year, they had said that they were going to be 40% renewable energy. Hmm. And they are on paper. Uh, they're 37.1% renewable energy. However, uh, what was it, 30%? Some of the classifications for the renewable part has gone, uh, the industry has changed. They don't consider biofuel, you know, burning, you know, old railroad ties as being a... Yeah, biomass. Yeah, yeah. yeah biomass as being a, a non-emitting source. Hmm. So it doesn't really qualify as, as, renewable. as a renewable. But they consider biofuels as part of their renewable energy mixture. Mm -hmm. And they also have imported energy as part of their renewable portfolio. So when you take out the imported renewables from other hmm. utilities outside of the province and their biofuels, they are actually uh, 1.7 gigawatts short of their 40% renewables. Hmm. Yeah. So if we were going to directly offset that 1. Uh, 1. 1.7 gigawatts, we compared that to the solar, the amount that it would produce based on the modeling software hmm. and then that's how we came up with that number i hope people are following this because <laughs> it, it's you guys are in the deep end which is great because it's on the record and stuff you know but but it's a common language like breathing for you guys you know and i'm sitting here hanging on it's going okay follow that follow that and i'm doing the, the layperson thing about oh so the solution for nb power to meet its carbon offset numbers would be to be installing solar panels because then they wouldn't be burning biomass. They wouldn't be stuck about what to do with Baldoon and an iron smelter and all that stuff. Because the solution is down at the household or the community level or small business level compared, is, yeah. compared to the industrial level. That theme is coming up in several other places. Food production is one, for example, yes. where we got to get back to nurturing the community instead of taking an industry, plunking it in an area and think that we've done economic development. This is economic development done in a, in a really interesting kind of household community autonomous but when you put all the pieces together it's got this collective impact that's really significant or potentially really significant yes and creates all those jobs and hmm, what are some other myths that um we can bang at so there's you know oh, the inter cold, they don't work in the cold okay that's that's one of the uh that's one of my favorite one i i teach solar across canada hmm. so that's one of the ones that i usually like to go and show them with my app and show them the production on a panel, hmm. you know, based in the wintertime with the same amount of light, 
uh, at a certain temperature. Now, it's opposite of what most people think. Mm -hmm. So it produces more power uh, when it's cold because it affects the voltage of the panel. So the voltage rises and everything rises. So the power rises. So the watts, like of the panel, you might be able to get uh, 330 watts out of a 315 watt panel when it's colder. That's interesting. So obviously there's a downside too. It's not like relationships at all. <laughs> <laughs> when it gets colder, it kind of drops a little bit. <laughs> so oh, in, the, in the summertime, <laughs> what when we put these monitoring systems in that show you each individual panel's production, hmm. and then a lot of the time uh, the customer will come back and go, well, it's, it's sunny and it's hot outside and it's producing less power than it did in April and May. And the reason for that is because of the temperature. Hmm. It's not that they're broken or failing or degrading quickly. It's just the heat drops back down the voltage. Hmm. And now that 315 is a 305. It's almost like if you've got a lot of um, um, servers, like a server farm, it's got to be kept cool. Yeah. So they can be running more efficiently. It parallels to that a little bit. And some of our, our systems in the northernmost part of New Brunswick are producing the best hmm. out of all of them. It's hmm. actually a, a thousand kilowatts over uh, the same exact size system in Fredericton uh, that actually tilts and it can change its its pitch yep. for the optimal angle to the sun. Yep. So we have a ground mount. It's producing about 12,000 uh, kilowatt hours a year. And the one that's fixed on a roof up north is producing 13, 13, hmm. 13,500. Interesting. Yeah. And when you mention up north, I think of the ice storm we had a few winters back. All those power poles going down. And the human solution is to put the power poles back up. I, I was there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm thinking, okay, Mother Nature sort of told us something. And maybe it was a once-in-a-lifetime thing. Maybe not. Uh, but we're still using a, a culture and a technology that was built in another era with all this other new technology and stuff hovering like right there looking for a place to take a foothold. Yeah, and then just the efficiency of the uh, of like a solar PV system with batteries, like an off-grid system, uh, looking around 80 to 85% efficiency. So that's the yeah. whole system. And then when you look at uh, the traditional poles and wire system, you're maybe 40 40% efficiency. So even that, even that's more efficient. Oh, interesting. Another factor in all of this, and it would tie to households, but maybe tied to community stuff um, to a degree, community grids. Um, in the 70s, California went through a bunch of brownouts. Other countries go through brownouts all the time where their power supply has to be dropped because of demand or because there's uh, the dam is way too low or take your pick about why. That points to humans need to change the behavior. North America has been really quite spoiled for a fairly long time with what we have and how I mean, we built it. But it's it's gotten, uh, I don't want to call it fat, but it's gotten kind of like this. This is our expectation level. Yeah. So another part of the solution would be a change in human behavior at the household level to meet what the power supply was generating for them to give them their autonomy. Yeah. So that's what we try to do when we go into the home and we introduce the, the app. So that monitoring app is a way of self-monitoring you know what's going on in your house why is your bill this amount you can't really put your finger on why uh, it was three hundred and fifty dollars this month uh, because you only get a bill in 30 days and it shows you the whole month in a snapshot on a piece of paper and there's no yeah. there's no intelligence there so Matrix. we introduce the, the app to the customer uh, it's usually installed under 500 bucks and they're able to actually see instantaneously uh, to the quarter second exactly what you're using. So when they first get it, I walk around the house with them. It's like, okay, this is how you read the meter. This is your watts here. And then we input all of the, the billing structure. So whatever you're paying for a monthly fee gets added. Uh, when your bill date is, uh, what's your rate class. And then we're able to go around and it will change the values. After a couple of days, it'll anticipate your bill and it'll show you graphs and everything going along. But usually people can go with that and they can look at, okay, what's an easy thing to change where I can reduce the amount of energy that I use? So it's generally it's lights, LEDs, or, or something simple like that. Or it may be as simple as um, looking at your, your deep freeze. Okay, how much does this cost? 
what's in it is it full is it is it empty what about the bar fridge outside you know is there any is there any beer in the bar fridge is it turned on mm -hmm. you know stuff like that you can usually save about 20 percent a year just, just by being just by knowing aware and yeah. it's it's such smart technology when we first installed it in our house mark would call me up and say what are we having for supper because he could see when i turned on the stove uh, so oh yeah you, you can program you can program everything it for down to that yeah so i could tell if it was a range burner or if it was the the grill or the burner for oh or, megan there's yeah. no escape <laughs> no escaping <laughs> Well, keep going. No, so it's it's that smart this technology now. So it's it's creating awareness. It's really showing people where they're using the energy in the house. Hmm. And he he would use it in his courses, and you could see when I was going around turning lights on and off around the house. Hmm. It's that instantaneous. Yeah. So on some it. sometimes I would forget turn the air conditioning app on or the heat on, showing the difference in between the two, hmm. and then go back to teaching, and then the air conditioner will be running at <laughs> whatever in the winter time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it was nice because it would actually, um, if you had something that was like an abnormal consumption. Yeah. So something's not quite right in the house. Maybe there's a, the pump is stuck on, the something's broken, the hot water yep. unit is wrong or, or something like that. It'll send you an alert and say, you know, abnormal consumption. And then you're going around investigating what what's going on. Oh, the pump's running or yep. left the pool on or something. Cool. Because that'll help the audience, you know. But what they're going to get from it is you can't miss it already. It's like we should be doing this like 10 years ago. You can feel that from both of you and that um, by banging at the myths, um, oh, that's not true. Oh, that's not true. Then people will go off and do their own Google yeah. search and then challenging yeah. it and yeah, all that yeah. stuff because yeah, they're sure. used to thinking of it one way and you're inviting them to think of it yeah. another way. That. And that's cool. always a, a, a thing. Um, let's slide back into some of the other myth stuff and then let's play some vision uh, stuff mm -hmm. where it could be and talk about some of your installations and stuff that that you're proud of and want to share the story to and we can insert the pictures and stuff as as when i edit and that but one of the other myths i wonder is uh the storage part in a household because of batteries now i visited a few houses who have this stuff and i got lost after he lifted the lid and talks about the battery array and it's like holy moly an exhaust outside for hydrogen or whatever it yeah. gets created i'm thinking whoa in the average householder i mean this is a passionate person who wants to do this stuff the average householder would be going mm, i'm not getting into all that they have enough to do in the course of a day it's changed a lot though i mean drew kind of went at it the way he wanted I'd to i'm thinking it too yeah. <laughs> like, i think i know who that is yeah you know uh, so so there's simpler versions obviously you mentioned just tap back into the grid but you pointed out in earlier conversations that uh, might not be overall benefit for the household because MB Power needs to change some sort of a rule or piece of legislation or something. Remember doing some math for me and saying, yeah, so you can have a, a net to the good, but you're, you're going to zero out at the end of the year, so you lose all that. Okay. I... So with the, uh, with the credits, basically the, the net... Uh, the net metered systems so the whole idea is to overproduce is to overproduce in the summer in order to bank credits so when you have less sun less production you start to use those accumulated credits and you can use those up until i think it's march, march the end 30th. of march and uh, anything left at march is wipe wipe clear yeah yeah but that's that's without storage that's just that's the um, net metered grid tied system hmm. so it doesn't make any sense to have a bigger solar system than what the household needs yeah. with that you, you don't get paid I mean a lot of people say well what's it going to pay me but yeah. it's not a, it's not a paid it's a net difference back so and you're forth. reducing your cost as opposed to getting paid exactly yeah. um, and you don't pay tax on that yeah um, do other provinces pay for the gener the power a household might produce New Brun or um, MB power no <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Nova Scotia, uh, they they don't want you to have a huge system, um, but they do kind of pay out the, the leftover credits yep. so at there, the end of the year. There's a it's called the enhanced net metering. 
program. Okay. So the enhanced part would be that they will pay you out at the prevailing rate for accumulated credits at the end of the year. Because, hmm. I mean, well, it just seems fair not yeah. to pick somebody's pocket every chance you get. Yeah. Um, I want to riff a little bit with a thought that crosses my mind as I listen and want to paint it into a bigger picture. So you mapped out, you know, so many homes, 80,000 homes in a certain window of time, lots of work for everybody, lots of potential for growth. With that would come a certain amount of power generation. With that would come sort of a reduced demand or need for NB power. So there's always a lovely irony to some things, like you should be working yourself out of a job. So while everybody yangs about utility and was tried to, you know, they tried to sell it uh, 10 years or so ago, um, see it as a liability, see it as an asset, but it's a necessity. But the way it's built maybe needs to be changed as well. So we're not just talking about solar panels on 80,000 homes in a 10-year window. We're talking about the utility itself needs to become something else because it seems like they're kind of an obstacle to getting those 80,000 homes kind of retrofitted. So maybe MB Power just becomes taking care of industry and this other thing can grow that takes care of residential. It, does it split that way, Megan? You want to play with that? Well, it... The business uh, model has to change. From NB Power? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, it's going to have to change because we're getting into more of a, a digital power market than we are a traditional well, power market. Well, you sit and talk about going through with your phone with the app on it, and you have all this knowledge and intelligence on your building, and you can self-monitor your building. Um, so, and you're generating, you know, a certain amount of your own power. So at some point, that takes that authority away from MB Power to be the sole source. Yeah. There, there was this really interesting case study down in Salt Lake City, where the utility is embracing solar. So, uh, it was Rocky Mountain Utility, uh, sewn in batteries, and a construction company called uh, Soleil. So they built Soleil Lofts. The utility owns each battery that is in each apartment building, and they use it as um, an energy hub. It's so now if there's a brownout or blackouts, then the whole apartment becomes self-sufficient. They have solar on the roof, and they have the batteries. And if there is any kind of power outage, they are not without power. But when the utility does need the batteries from each apartment building, they use the batteries. Mm -hmm. So it creates a win-win-win situation for the user, the utility, and uh, the apartment buildings. Yeah. So it's all about the, uh, you know, harnesses of harnessing the production of the solar and then optimizing a battery system. So using it when you need to, because there's a, this sudden uh, uphill swing for demand after two o'clock, right? So if we have a lot of generation coming off of solar, so it's the highest at noon. And if you look at the, uh, the traditional generation equipment, now that would be at its lowest. So we have one that's highest going down mm. and we have the other one that's significantly low so there's this gap that needs to be filled in there yeah. so it's a four hour or so gap that needs to be smoothed out in order to bring back up your baseline generation to match so there's a void there so they call that the duck curve because that's when the end of solar and then the peak of the you know traditional units so that's where the uh the energy storage comes in as a benefit and the more people that install solar then it also creates a baseline of solar generation because they they say hmm. that it's going to be too much of a peak and drop of energy production. Hmm. Where, where realistically the home consumption is way more sporadic than the generation from solar. Okay. I think uh, we included that graph just to kind of highlight that point. So they're, they're talking about the differences in generation yeah. and uh, yeah, here. compare that with... So consumption. this is a solar production and it's a nice curve, but this is what the home is using. So if there are more homes that have solar, it creates a, a better baseline. And just like a, a home using and shutting things off, it's very sporadic and it creates a baseline among all okay. of the homes. We can create a baseline with more solar. Hmm. This is fun. Thanks. <laughs> 
<laughs> the um because the, the wheels get firing so what about this what about that so let's morph from a household version into a community-based solar grid system so you're doing a I don't know if it'd be a thousand homes or five thousand homes, but there's technology now that you could take a few acres of field. Um, you get it through social media all the time. You see the cows or the sheep going through between the solar panels. It's this multi-use land use, and and it's generating power for a neighborhood of five thousand houses or something. Our you're working on the household level, but somewhere just off to the side, there's that for you guys too at that, that scale if someone has the courage to kind of go and mm. crank it right <laughs> so do you have a story or two about how that's possible you go ahead yeah we're kind of designing that right now mm. it's in the uh, 3d modeling stage okay uh, we've bought a large parcel just uh, about five minutes from here okay so it's close to uh, two transmission lines and one distribution line. So two big tall towers and then a smaller, you know, like um, distribution feeder. It probably feeds your house, actually. Okay. Yeah. So we're looking at a project where we're going to incorporate both uh, solar plus storage and, uh, and have the homes there also. So that... So there's a couple of different things with a large solar farm or... Uh, solar gardens is another thing that they call them or mm. solar co-ops so people can invest in solar in a solar co-op or solar farm without having solar on their roofs some people they can't have solar on the roofs because they rent uh, the home the home is structurally not sound to have solar and so anyone who has a power bill can invest in solar with a solar garden or solar co-op um, it's currently, uh, it's called a virtual net metering program. So virtual net metering is it's pretty easy. So people come together around shared values yeah. yes. without having the infrastructure. Yeah, that's, that's right. That's interesting. It's very cool. So it brings <laughs> it back again to the people owning the power, working together uh, with their own system. Hmm. So it's, it's a win-win for everyone who's involved. No, this isn't um, a fantasy, right? This is doable. Absolutely, absolutely. They <laughs> <laughs> so Nova Scotia. They they've just announced uh, a couple of solar gardens that they are going to be building. Um, there's none in New Brunswick, but the problem that we have here is there's no power purchase agreements available. The uh, ones that are being held up have no you know, mandated timeline. Uh, it's not really being enforced. There are, there are some that uh, that went out for proposal, but uh, hmm. there's been no, there's been no activity on them. So we put in for, <coughs> I think we put in for a, a gigawatt of capacity on it, and at that point it was days after, and everything had all been filled up, so we couldn't even do anything, and that was years ago, hmm. and we would have, we would have done it. Because we had, uh, we purchased the land for that, for you know specifically. And now in the federal Pan Canadian framework, they said that the climate change action plan outlines a bold vision for New Brunswick and sets renewed GHG reduction targets, 2030 targets of 35% below the 1990 levels and 80% below the 2001 levels by 2050. The plan also addresses other commitments such as the Canadian Energy Strategy released by the Council of the Federation in 2015 and contains a climate change adaption strategy supported by action to build resilience in New Brunswick communities, businesses, infrastructure, and natural resources. That was all one sentence. <laughs> <laughs> so, in May 2015, the province introduced legislation to allow local entities to develop renewable energy sourced electricity generation in their communities. This will enable universities, nonprofit organizations, cooperatives, First Nations, and municipalities to contribute to MB Power's renewable energy requirements. So it sounds like a door is open, but that was 2013. That was 2015. 15. And there are no power purchase agreements available. So it is in the pan-canadian framework but we are unable to do it 
so it's really stalled out like i say module prices have come down mm -hmm. but i think they're just holding on uh they're just holding the ball until i don't know until somebody really pushes them until uh they so can really it, say okay it is now time to do it or you're going to lose your position or pay for the uh the engineering fee now mm -hmm. to see if you are serious this is kind of a personal thing for me for decades now when i fly into toronto i'm always chirping when i look out at the window at all that asphalt and black roof surface area just sucking heat yeah you know i'm thinking they could be doing so much with that space um, do you ever do that when you fly over a city and you see all the potential not being used? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. When we fly into different areas, we're, we're looking at either one, the solar that is on the roof, giving a little high five, or we're looking at, you know, this big roof that's maybe a, a, a transport truck distribution center or something like that. Nice, long, yep. no lights on it, maybe a couple of AC units, but yep. otherwise unobstructed. We drive around Fredericton going, that would be good. Yeah, because you, <laughs> you see it from the roof, right? Yeah. Um, and we got to start doing, seeing our community from a different perspective so that we see where the opportunities are. Um, final thoughts? Is there anything we didn't touch on that, that you wanted to? Well, I, I can't stress enough that we need a direct solar incentive in New Brunswick. That is going to jumpstart... The, the industry here. I guess one of the my other my other thoughts uh, would be just on the commercial side of, of doing uh, these uh, systems like for the library or for maybe a business maybe it be uh, you know a large warehouse or something like that so there are tax credits that are available that are quite uh, quite good really there there's a, uh, a tax clause 43.2 which is basically a uh, hundred percent uh, investment tax credit for qualifying renewable energy systems and that's a, a first year no half year rule uh, in order to drop your capital down you can claim 100% of that year one hmm. and then it goes on to give you energy you know lead standards you can increase those with it um, you can cool your roof down by putting solar on it yep. uh, it makes your roof last longer Yep. because now the sun is not degrading your roof so you might get longevity out of your roof it may cool it down less air conditioner load 100 percent tax deductible year one uh and it works for the next 30 years Ooh, that reminds me there's one last thing i wanted to talk about too so the education part of it and also the jobs that are going to be needed not just solar installers we need a whole a whole fleet of um, professionals so you know uh, we need solar installers solar designers project managers inspectors engineers researchers manufacturers distribution transportation uh, heavy equipment everything accounting sales force like people keep people are afraid that this industry is going to take jobs or ruin jobs from these other industries but we need these already qualified uh, specialists to come and join this industry. Like, we need them. We need help, mm -hmm. and you know they're they're really fun, exciting jobs to do. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's it's not taking away jobs. It's just moving them to an, a different industry. Any you can in concur. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I see it. Well, we hired a bunch of guys that were out in the oil industry in yeah. yes. other places, and a lot of the people that are that do have jobs out there now are, are looking for employment back here or something different, or you know, yeah. looking to change change of pace or change of rent out there. Or well, we've seen through the media or social media for several years now that there's more work opportunity and development opportunity in green technology. Um, than there is in the oil patch. Absolutely. It's, but it's just having that courage to cross over the threshold to give yeah. it a go. Yeah. You should check out, I think we have a, a video on our Facebook of a, um, a hyperlapsed film walking through the solar convention in, I think it was, was it? In Salt New, Lake. Salt Lake. Yeah. So, and you can kind of get an idea of just the people that are at one of these events. So they have over 20,000 registered attendees. So I would have a, you know an expo yeah. pass 
and then they have more people from that and we you should see the, uh, the the world map of where are you from and you put your little dot on it it's just it's all over the world yeah yeah it's it is it's global and it's so exciting because people who are getting into the industry it's new and it's fun and people are trying to collaborate and just make these projects as exciting and big as they possibly can and you know it's it's a lot of collaboration among the industry uh, there there's not a lot of competition it's it's more of a collaboration which is it's cooperation cooperation that's right yeah. so but, I, I I can't help but point this out but I mean I train my competition yeah so I train solar installers well what do you do well I own a solar installation company yeah, yeah I'm directly training my competition because there is too much work to really do it myself I recognize that that sparks in me two things. One, my interview with Niels Riemann when he was here, he left after three years. He was in CBD oil business. He'd come from Ireland by way of Finland, I believe. Wanted to live in New Brunswick, start a business here, mid thirties. Couldn't get past how um, lack of how uncooperative um, other businesses were with each other. He needed the culture. He was used to another culture. But well, I help you, you help me, and then the whole thing moves a yep. little bit, you know. And then that reminds me of the craft brewery industry in New Brunswick, where those guys and girls all help each other all the time. And they've created a whole culture in a 15 year window, roughly. That's amazing. But, yeah, because and that's maybe a new business model, which we didn't touch on. But you're not in competition with each other because you're all working towards the same goals. That's right. And, and there's lots to be had right now. Yeah. So that's another culture shift. Yeah. Final, final thoughts. I'm good. Yeah, I think I'm uh... <laughs> I think I'm good. I can't. I can't really think of anything. Um, I mean, when I, I when I teach this, I teach a four day course, uh, so I just don't want to keep rambling on about the same thing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I have All that. Uh, I can do that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I think people's eyes would just glaze over, and then they'd look for something different. <laughs> yeah. Thank you too for this. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. And thank you for watching. As always, be good. Have fun. Love each other.